Simon, you're leaving this place at the end of this week. How do you feel about that? Oh, I feel complete, finished, you know, like I've done what I came here to do. I'm thrilled to be handing it on uh, to a fantastic leader in Jolie and a business in good shape that can go on and do great things. So I feel very good about, uh, about my tenure here and excited about what might be next. It's been seven years. When you first arrived, it was, in fact, back then called Telecom. Mm. Do you feel like you've achieved what you wanted to with Spark? Yes, well, uh, you know, the, the old telecom business by 2012 was a company that was in decline on practically every metric you could find. When market share declines, revenue declines, profitability declines, declining employee engagement, uh, brands were in decline. So to, to be here seven years later with, you know, one of the best brands in, in New Zealand and biggest and, and most strongly known in Spark, the leading brand in Telco with Skinny, growing market shares, um, improving financial performance in a range of, you know, new business activities, everything from sports streaming through to cloud IT. It's a, it's a good position and I, you know, I do feel like we've turned this business around and, and executed a really strong transformation. You've made some pretty big calls over that time too. You've had the quantum restructure, you've introduced agile working, uh, most recently Spark Sport and who can forget the rebrand from Telecom mm -hmm. to Spark mm -hmm. that you championed. How tough were those decisions to make? Look, they're all big decisions, but the, you know, these are large, a large company like Spark is, has a lot of inertia associated with it. It has a lot of entrenched infrastructure, a lot of contractual arrangements. Uh, a lot of persona and perception around its brand in the public's mind and millions of customers. So moving a big company forward like that, you have to do big, bold things to overcome the inertial impact. And so while they, you know, the, the, many of the decisions we made were very big and very bold, if you think of the counterfactual, which would be doing a hundred small things, if we were sitting here today and had done a hundred small things, we wouldn't have the outcomes that we had so uh, so there were big tough calls at the time and uh, and not always greeted with you know applause actually these decisions are often when you when you drive change the most immediate response you get um, from the public as those who are opposed to that change and they have a loud voice so it's been it's been quite a journey and and you know you have to test your mettle a few times when you make those big calls but We've done it and I've been backed by a fantastic team who've executed really well and so those big choices have come off, thankfully. What was the hardest decision of those that you had to make? The biggest decision by far was the rebranding. I mean, it's not every day you confront a choice to ditch, you know, what at the time Telecom was probably the most, if not the most, one of the top five known brands in New Zealand that would have had a valuation on it in the billions and to, you know, choose to ditch it uh, and adopt a brand new name in Spark um, was a very big call, probably the biggest call I'll ever make in my career. But you know, other, some of the other choices we've made have been very significant too, not the least of which the initial strategy choice to go for digital services, not just play the safe telco connectivity game. And that's what's taken us into media streaming or cloud IT or cyber security services and things, and they were not easy things to, uh, to enter into. And, and the decision to go all in agile, first telco in the world to go all in agile, and the first big company in this part of the world to embrace agile methodologies from a traditional business background, um, they, were, they were big hard choices and uh, you know, they've, been, they've been tough to work through, but here we are, we've, we've pulled them off. Any regrets? No regrets, actually. Um, I think you look back on these and say, well, you'd only have regrets if you felt you played it too safe or didn't work hard enough or failed to get that coalition of the willing behind you. And actually, I can't look back and think, mm, no, I didn't. I didn't take the easy option, actually, any time we, we made the big calls, we moved on. Um, and at the very most, I'd, you know, I'd say, well, could we have done one or two of those things a bit earlier and a bit more, you know, aggressively or something like that? But actually, no, no real regrets looking back. I've done the best I could do with this business. Yeah. You're quite the advocate of 5G, aren't you? Do you think it's really all that it's cracked out to be? 4G radically changed the utility of mobiles and turned, turned mobile devices into 
uh, video machines and, uh, and 4G completely overwhelmed all of the early estimates of you know, what was a reasonably sceptical response when we were in the 3G world, and I believe 5G will be exactly the same. It'll be transformative relative to 4G because it is, just gives us so much more capacity for the same dollar of equipment cost, so much better speed and so much less latency in the transaction. It will unleash uh, the true potential of wireless. And customers prefer wireless. It, it, it's not a fixed versus wireless factor in the minds of consumers. Consumers have already made that decision, they're wireless. Um, home broadband is nothing but a backhaul service to a home wireless network and so in the way most households work. So wireless wins and 5G just takes wireless up another order of magnitude and capability and it will we'll all be blown away by what we're doing with our mobiles and wireless devices in three or four years time. You've been quite open and frank about your displeasure over the government uh, deciding to ban uh, your use of Huawei and the rollout of 5G. How do you think that was handled by the government? Look, I understand that you know, the government have a role to play in these and, and have a different set of criteria to spark and how they make these decisions. But for us, it's a simple matter of that Huawei are an outstanding supplier. They have tremendous technology. They've partnered with us for many years over uh, 4G technologies and you know we have no evidence and there hasn't ever been any evidence globally that they're involved in any sort of spying activity so you know we would like them to be part of the mix and we hope that that you know in the passage of time that we can overcome those concerns around uh, around their um, their approach uh, and uh, but unfortunately more recently of course the plots thickened around Huawei with uh, with the American moves to blacklist them in the trade um, uh, rules, and uh, and that's made it a more complex issue. And so, you know, we we're just hopeful that in due course, um, Huawei can again be part of the technology mix uh, for New Zealand telcos. And you know, Spark uses them significantly, but so too to two degrees. Uh, uh, Vodafone, Chorus, the whole industry uses a lot of Huawei technology and so something we want resolved. Is that a request for the government to allow Huawei to be used by telecommunications companies? Oh, I think they know we want them uh, <laughs> to, uh, to find a way to solve this problem and allow Huawei to participate in this market but you know they've got their processes to go through and we respect that. The big players always talk about when it comes to competition this triple threat that there are three big players uh, yourself, Spark, Vodafone uh, and uh, Two Degrees but is that really true? Is it, is it not a duopoly that's actually ruled by Vodafone and Spark? Oh, these, it's a, today a hyper competitive market in telecommunications. In mobile that's correct, there are three players in mobile but there are 80 players in the broadband market and, uh, and broadband markets delivered through a wholesale infrastructure which makes it hot, the barriers to entry are extremely low and as you noted you know it's not just telcos in the broadband game today there's power companies and others involved in that. In mobile we you know we have a three player market which for, for this small country with a small population having three full blown network nationwide network providers is a remarkable outcome actually that the market can sustain that and and leads to extremely healthy competition and the evidence is clear about that the mobile mobile plans and pricing in New Zealand is is very competitive uh, on any international metric and we have you know plenty of MV and O access as well we have plenty of other brands working off these networks so it's a it's a healthy competitive market what are you going to do next? I'm going to take some time <laughs> to <laughs> let my mind empty out a bit because these are, you know, it's an incredibly demanding job. Um, leading a company with this complexity and this many moving parts, but also with such a high public profile. And so when your mind gets jammed with that, it's very hard actually to think about what's next. But I can tell you what I'm not interested in, which is, you know, I'm not a politician and that was I never my next will question. be. Uh, and, uh, and you know I'm, I'm not retiring so I, I'd like to do something meaningful but I'm going to take a wee while just to let that find me or I'll find it and we'll, we'll see what happens but first off I'm just taking a break with my family. 
Can you see yourself picking up another chief executive role? I mean, I hear there's a few going. There's Air yeah. New Zealand down the road or a ANZ, if banking tickles your fancy. I've, look, I've had the, I'm not sure if it's a, a compliment or, you know, ha how to quite portray it, but, you know, my name gets associated now just because I resigned a wee while ago with every other resignation. Suddenly I'm a candidate. Uh, but, um, but look, I'd just rather take a little bit of time to think through what I want to do next. Um, I and mean, I can certainly see myself um, as a CEO or an executive chairman again. I'd like, as I said, I'm a hands-on guy. I'm not, I'm not rushing to a boardroom career, or, but again, I'm not averse to, uh, you know, um, providing some input in the governance, you know, um, role somewhere. But. Uh, but I'll, I'll just let, you know, let time tell me what the answer is there. Mm -hmm. What made you think that this was the right time to pass on that baton though? I've completed the things I said I would, you know, would do when I arrived in the business. I always said I'd work five to seven years. It's seven years. I've actually done the, the longer part of that. It's a, it's a tough draining business and, uh, and my skills were right for that seven year period and I think Jolie's skills uh, will be better than mine. Hopefully she'll lead the business and, uh, and the team that she's putting around her are different. Their skills and their talents uh, uh, and their approach are different from the people I needed around me when we had a lot of the, you know, call it heavy lifting and change program to do. So, uh, so it just feels like the right time for everyone, for the company, for me and for Jolie.